Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Western Avenue Baptist Church. Let me go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to be able to go back to your word. We thank you for the ministries um, that are going on tonight across the church. We pray for Awana later tonight. We do pray that you would bring both the kids as well as the workers here safely. We pray that the ministry to those kids, uh, especially the teaching, would be done well and that you would use that teaching to sow seeds of salvation in the hearts of those children, that they may submit to your son, Jesus Christ. Father, we pray for the lesson tonight. Uh, be with our brother, Terry. Uh, may he be able to convey the fruits of his studies and do so clearly and help to illuminate our hearts and our minds to receive that truth, that we may be edified by it and be further conformed into the image of your son. And Father, we pray that you be glorified in all things. And we lift these things up in his name, Christ Jesus. Amen. slow getting set up here. Sorry about that. I got carried away reading and <laughs> forgot to turn my tablet on. <clears throat> That's not right. So... We got started in Mark chapter 13. Where Jesus has moved from his ministry in the temple to uh, the Mount of Olives. And he started teaching his disciples about things to come. They asked him, if you remember verse 13, he's going out of the temple and the um, disciples comment on the majesty of the, the buildings and the building blocks. And they are amazed, very impressed by those things. And we took, some, took a look at some pictures last time so we can understand why they are impressed by those things. But he says in verse 2, of chapter 13, you know, you think these buildings are so great? <laughs> well, just wait. You know, all these stones are going to be rubble one of these days. <clears throat> then his disciples ask him, verse 4, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are going to be fulfilled? And fulfilled means to be wrapped up, to be brought to completion. <clears throat> it comes from the word which means to end, to achieve the goal. I don't know what happened to my voice, sorry about that. <laughs> it's abandoned me again. So he, we talked about some of these things last time. He actually begins with their second question. The first question is, when will these happen? And the second question is, what will be the sign? So he starts with signs. And I rearrange these slides a little bit to get some better organization. He starts by talking about common occurrences, verses 5 to 13. These are things that will happen which will kind of like be characteristic of what's going to happen at the end, but these are things that happen all the time anyway. They're not limited to just the end, the very end of things. That's why he says in 7 and 8, when there will be wars and rumors of wars, he says, don't worry, you know, don't panic. There will always be wars, and there will always be famines, there will always be earthquakes. Now, God has used earthquakes and famines as judgments. We saw that 
in the Old Testament. <clears throat> but those things happen all the time. So these are kind of like characteristic. Things are going to be hard. Things are going to be dangerous. But that's kind of life. You know, that's the way things work. As the Bible says, man was born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. You know, problems come along with life. <laughs> of course, the person who said that was a little bit depressed at the time. <clears throat> but it's true, you know. How many times are you going along very smoothly and getting things done and you know, all of a sudden something comes in to block you? You think, why now? <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't escape it. So these are common occurrences. They are kind of pointing to the end, but they don't indicate the, that the end is here. So we saw in uh, verses... Uh, whoops, too far... Uh, verses 5 and 6, that there will be self-proclaimed messiahs. Many will come in my name, he says in verse 6, saying, I am he, and will mislead many. And that word mislead, as we saw, is that word to lead astray, to wander. They will deceive. We saw the wars and the rumors of wars. They're going to happen. And he says at the end of verse 8, these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Birth pangs is a, a symbol of God's judgment throughout the Bible. It's things are coming fast. And so when you see these things happen, it's a warning that things are getting bad, but you're not there yet. And then to verse 8, we have earthquakes and famines. Again, these things happen all the time. So it is kind of foreshadowing what's happening at the end. And then finally, verses 9 to 13, persecution. We looked at the fact that they will be arrested and hauled into court and that there will be family divisions. Family members will fight each other, turn each other in. And 13, you will be hated by all on account of my name. And if everybody you know is going to be against you. But the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. We looked at uh, Acts chapters 4 and 5 about the first part there, being hauled into court and having to give testimony. It happened to Peter and John when they healed the man at the temple door and hauled into court twice actually warned not to preach or teach in Jesus name but they decided they needed to obey God rather than the rulers and uh, they had an opportunity then in the court situation to present the truth and that's basically the point of that you're hauled into court because you have a message that those people need to hear And he tells them not to be afraid of what they're going to say. Um, yeah, in verse 11, don't plan a speech, but leave room for the Holy Spirit to put words in your mouth because it's the Holy Spirit giving you the, the opportunity so he'll give you the things to say. <clears throat> We left off at that point. We didn't quite finish the discussion of persecution. I mentioned Hebrews chapter 6 and chapter 10, and I want to talk a little bit more about those and how they relate to this point. Because he says there at the end of verse 13, the one who endures to the end, he shall be saved. So he's talking about persecution. The one who endures the persecution remains faithful to God all the way through will receive the blessing, the reward from God. The one who gives up, wimps out because of the persecution isn't going to get anything but judgment. And this is why it, it reminded me of Hebrews 
um, because that's the whole point of the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> so to set the context for these two passages, and this, these are just two of many passages in the book of Hebrews that, that say these things, but they say them very clearly. Um, we, we studied the book of Hebrews, it's been what, two years ago? Doesn't seem like that long. Uh, so if you were in our study of Hebrews, this will be familiar. Uh, the book of Hebrews is written by a, a Jew to Jews, a Jewish congregation. And there were some people in that congregation who had committed themselves to the new covenant. They re identified Jesus as the Messiah and they submitted to him and endorsed or in, embraced the new covenant, which means they had to leave the old covenant. But then their family and friends who were still living by the old covenant were giving them a hard time because, you know, you're fighting the law of Moses, which was an accusation they made against Jesus. But they didn't understand the law of Moses. <laughs> anyway, you're going against the law of Moses, so, you know, you're, this is wrong, and they started persecuting them. And some of the people in that Jewish congregation were wanting to go back to the old covenant, abandon the new covenant, just to avoid the persecution. And the writer to the Hebrews, all through the book, gives them reason after reason after reason after reason after reason not to do that. And the main thing is, if you go back to the old covenant, you're putting yourself under judgment because the old covenant doesn't work anymore. In chapter 8, he explains why there had to be a new covenant. He quotes from Jeremiah 31, where Jeremiah predicted a new covenant. The Old Covenant was an external set of rules that didn't have any kind of provision for the people to keep them. They had to keep them through their own energy, and of course, we're human, <laughs> we fail. That's why they have the sacrificial system. When they broke the law, they could do a sacrifice and be forgiven. <clears throat> so the New Covenant, the writer to Hebrews says in chapter eight, will be an internal covenant. The law will be on their hearts. It won't be an external list of do's and don'ts, but it will be a spiritual law that they will be able to keep because they will want to. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 7. He has a new desire to please God, doesn't want to sin. So that's the new covenant. But they were going to go back, and he says you can't do that. Because now your hope is through the new covenant. The old covenant doesn't work anymore. If you do go back, you're going to be facing judgment. So he encourages them throughout the book to remain faithful because God rewards the faithful ones and judges those who are not faithful. So let's go over there, if you're not there already. Uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Verses 11 and 12 it says, And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence. He just gave an example of people who are faithful. The same diligence, so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end, that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That's the only way to get the promises, <laughs> through faith and patience. And the word patience there is the same word we have here in Mark chapter 13, to remain under, to endure under those difficult circumstances, to put up with it. And then chapter 10, verses 36 through 38, says, for you have need of endurance, the same word again, so that when you have done the will of God, which is to endure, you may receive what was promised. And then he quotes from the Old Testament, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. And we won't take time to go to chapter 11, but you're familiar with Hebrews 11, all the people who went through persecution in the Old Testament, the prophets, etc., who remained faithful in spite of the persecution. And as a result, the writer says, they got the blessing. They got the reward. 
because they remain faithful. So he's trying to encourage this Jewish congregation to remain faithful to the new covenant and not to lapse back into the old covenant, which doesn't work anymore. <clears throat> so we have the idea back to Mark chapter 13 about endurance. Endure to the end. He shall be saved. And the idea of saved there is, is basically brought to the completion of your salvation. That's glorification. Um, let's see. The one who endures to the end. Yeah. The end means, of course, the end of when all this is going to be wrapped up. <laughs> as long as you're alive, you remain faithful to God. And the word to the end there means to the extreme, to, the, to completion. Uh, it's variously translated. Uh, it can mean to bring to completion, to reach the goal. It's translated finally in 1 Peter 3.8 when he's coming to the end of his book. Last point, finally. <laughs> That's the idea of this word here. Uh, the King James usually translates, translates this word to the uttermost to the end degree, to the fullness, the completion. So here it's the one who maintains his commitment to Christ and doesn't abandon it because of persecution. And that, that, that uh, faithfulness is an evidence of true salvation. If they weren't really saved, they wouldn't be able to do that. John tells us, 1 John chapter 2, I think it is, around verse 19, some people had left the church, and he says he, they left because they weren't really part of us. If they had been part of us, they wouldn't have left. They would have stayed. So it's the same idea. The one who has the patience to endure has genuine salvation, and therefore he will receive the ultimate end of that salvation, which is glorification. We have that process summarized in Romans eight twenty nine and 30. Of those he foreknew, he you know, chose and predestined to be glorified, and etc. <clears throat> so the end stage there in that salvation is glorification in heaven. So there's a lot at stake here. And persecution can make one discouraged, like, you know, this just isn't worth it. But uh, Mark is saying here, and the writer to Hebrews says there, yes, it is worth it. <laughs> because the alternative you don't want to think about. So persecution is going to be another sign of the end, but it's not the end yet. It's leading up to it. Persecution is what's going to happen. It's like the wars. It's like the pestilence. It's like all these other things. They happen all the time. But they are characteristic of the end. And so when you see those things happening, even though they happen all the time, keep in mind, okay, this is what's coming. Yeah, the definition of persecution is variable. <laughs> Genuine persecution does, as you say, come from the outside. Because if you do something, I wrote an essay a couple of years ago on why bad things happen. And the most obvious and the simplest reason bad things happen is because people do things that have bad results. You know, being addicted to drugs is a bad thing. Well, if you don't want that bad consequence, don't take drugs. But that's not persecution. You know, that you're, you're shooting yourself in the foot when you do things like that. So, while James says we're led into sin when we're led by our, 
own lusts. You know, you can't blame anybody else for that. So, I suppose in one sense, persecution is ultimately an attack on God. Satan's attack on God. He can use people to persecute God's people, to give them problems. But even in the immediate situation, persecution is still from outside, from other people. If you do something stupid and get, get in trouble for it, that's your fault. That's not persecution. Right. Yeah, that's a good example. Acts chapter 9. Paul was persecuting the church, but Jesus knocks him off his horse and says, why are you persecuting me? If you're persecuting God's people, it's an attack on God. Yeah, and that, that is Satan's uh, mode of operation. Yeah, that's, what, that's what he does. He can't get at God directly, so he gets at God indirectly by causing God's people problems. And he can cause those problems by using other people. I had a, a guy who worked for us in the reading and writing lab at the college. <clears throat> he was, he was uh, Arabic and Muslim. But he was dead on in his description of Satan interacting with people. He, he said, Satan will tempt you to do something and you give in to the temptation, and you get in trouble for it, and Satan backs off. <laughs> so you're left there to take the full brunt <laughs> of the consequences. He's the one that got you into it, <laughs> but you're the one who pays the price. Yeah, it works that way. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those are the... Uh, uh, common occurrences, they're kind of like, I almost want to say external signs. They're not signs that the end is around the corner, but they are leading up to it. They're the same kind of thing. So when you see these things happening, remember, okay, get prepared. You've got time, you know, get prepared. <clears throat> so then he switches to what I call theological occurrences not common occurrences. This has more to do, these are, the, these are the signs of the imminence of the end. When you see these things happening, duck, because it's coming fast. And we see that in, in verses 14 to 27. We're not going to finish all this tonight, but we'll get a start on it. 14 says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let him who is on the housetop not go down to enter in to get anything out of his house and let him who is in the field not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are with child and to those who nurse babes in those days. <clears throat> but pray that it may not happen in the winter for those days will be a time of tribulation such as has uh, not occurred since the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never shall. Let's stop there for now. So that's basically an intensification of persecution, 14 to 20. We, saw, we just ended the previous section talking about persecution, but that's kind of like every day. You know, that's going to happen. They're going to haul you into court, and uh, don't worry about those things. But now, this gets personal. <laughs> this gets really heavy. You're no longer just going to be in court. In fact, you don't want to hang around to find out what's going to happen. 
you need to leave <laughs> and leave town now. As it says, if you're up on the roof of your house, and those, the houses back then had flat roofs and people used them sort of as patios, uh, if you get word that uh, the enemy is coming for you, don't even go into the house to pack a lunch or whatever. <laughs> you just run. And if you're out working in the field and you've taken your coat off, don't go back to pick it up. Now this was the outer cloak, this, this was covering for the cool nights. So don't worry about being cold at night. <laughs> Get out of town. And of course, difficult for, for uh, pregnant women and women who are nursing children to travel. And pray that it doesn't happen in winter. The cold weather, it's hard to travel in the cold weather, plus rains and snow can hinder, um, hinder your progress. The reason for that, verses 19 and 20, it's going to be bad. Nothing like it ever since then or after this. <clears throat> you may think you have it bad now. and <laughs> Just wait. There's a contrast there. We need to talk a little bit about this idea of the abomination of desolation and this may take the rest of our time um, the words are interesting and the the picture it gives it kind of fills out what's going on here it it's kind of reminds me of Genesis chapter 6 when everyone on earth had nothing but evil in his mind and heart, except for Noah and his family. Uh, it's the same thing here. Now, it's going to be total evil. The word abomination uh, is a noun, of course. It comes from a verb which means to feel nausea or loathing for a food. So the noun form basically means an object of disgust. An abomination like, ugh, <laughs> don't want to eat any more of that. It's like you've eaten too much at dinner and you, you can't hold another bite. You know, just the thought of eating more food <laughs> makes you sick to your stomach. This word is linked to idolatry throughout the Old Testament. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ezekiel chapter 8, he gives a vision he had of the temple. And inside the temple, on the walls, the people had um, drawn pictures of the idols and the idol worship, all the ceremonies, the kind of graffiti inside the temple. And it, this word is used. That's an abomination to God. The, dem the temple has been disfigured. This is not what's supposed to be going on there. So they were actually worshiping idols in the temple and they were drawing the pictures of the idol worship. That's an abomination. That doesn't belong there. It also extends to attitudes and values that, that uh, conflict with God's. Uh, in Luke 16, 15, he, Luke, or God, Jesus says that the people there were justifying themselves in their unfortunate behavior. But he says the things that you think are good are an abomination to God because it goes against what God has established. <clears throat> so when it says the abomination of desolation, verse 14, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, <laughs> that's the temple. It shouldn't be in the temple. It could be an idol that's set up in, tem in the temple, or it can be a, a person who is conducting idolatry in the temple, but it's not supposed to be there. It could be an idolatrous person. And it makes the temple useless to the Jews because the temple now has been contaminated. 
So the Jews aren't going to go in there to worship because it, it would have to be cleansed and everything before they were, would be able to use it. And that kind of brings us to the second word there, abomination of desolation. The word desolation uh, comes from the noun that, or the adjective that means solitary or desolate, like a desert. You know, you go out here in the middle of the desert and what's out there? Nothing. <laughs> it's pretty much useless territory. Now, I know there are people going to say, oh, the desert is beautiful, you know, you hike out there. <laughs> well, we have psychiatrists for a reason. Anyway, <laughs> the, uh, it's a wasteland, you know, it's not useful, it's desolate. That's what the word desolate means. So the temple has been made desolate because the people have abandoned it. It's no man's land. They don't go there anymore. It's like Yogi Berra said once when somebody suggested that they go out to eat at a certain place. He said, nah, nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the temple has been made desolate or unusable by the people because it's been contaminated. So another way of reading this, the abomination of desolation, it's the abomination that causes desolation. It's been misused. As just we saw a few chapters ago when Jesus cleansed the money changers and the merchants out of the temple. They were misusing the temple. It's the same kind of thing. <clears throat> now, yeah, this will take the rest of our time. When you see, and the word when there is really the word whenever. It was the same back in uh, verse 11. It says, when they arrest you. It really says in the Greek, whenever they arrest you. Like, this is going to happen often. <laughs> it's going to be repeated. Okay. So, the when, whenever you see the abomination of desolation, which implies it's going to happen more than once. <clears throat> it has happened more than once. Well, it's happened twice, and it will happen again. As we discussed before, some of the things he says here apply to the disciples that he's talking to. Things are going to happen in their lifetime, like the destruction of the temple. Other things apply to the tribulation period, which is coming up in the future. <clears throat> so we've had three abominations of desolation throughout history. Well, we had two so far. The third one is coming in the tribulation. Daniel mentioned it in Daniel chapter 7, the abomination of desolation. That wasn't the first time it happened. That was a warning. The first time it happened is when Antiochus Epiphanes came in. We, we discussed this before. You know, when Alexander the Great died in 336 BC, his world empire was divided between his generals. One of those generals was named Seleucus, and he was given the territory of Syria, which is north of Israel, eastward to Persia. Well... He and his descendants looked down at Israel. You know, Ptolemy was another of, of uh, Alexander's generals. He got Egypt and North Africa. So Israel is sitting between these two Greek empires. And so Seleucus, his descendants, said, well, we ought to annex Israel. <laughs> you know, it's obvious we need to make that part of our Greek uh, empire. So Antiochus, Epiphanes, also Antiochus the fourth. He was like the fourth one in line after Seleucus initially, initially set up camp in Syria. He went down and kind of approached Israel on friendly terms, like, let me help you. But in reality, he just wanted to take over. And one of the ways he took over was to go into the temple and proclaim <clears throat> that the temple is now a temple to Zeus, the chief of the Greek gods. 
that was an abomination enough, okay? Because a Gentile goes into the temple. That would make it unclean enough for the Jews not to want to go back in there to worship because it's been contaminated. You remember in Jesus' trial, the, the Jews brought Jesus to Pilate, but they wouldn't go inside the courtroom because it was Gentile territory. And if they went in there, they would be contaminated and they wouldn't be able to celebrate the Passover, which is ironic because they were going to kill the Messiah. You know, so anyway, same thing. They're not going to go into a place where a Gentile has been. Plus, he sacrificed a sow on the altar, and that really did it for the Jews. That made the temple desolate to them. They're not going to go back in there. It's no man's land. So that's the first abomination of desolation that happened. The second one was in 70 AD when the temple was destroyed and Israel or Jerusalem was burned. In about 68 AD, there was a guy. You wonder about people sometimes. He was a Jew, but he was a zealot. Remember, the zealots were the group of Jews who wanted Rome out of there. And they were very militant. This wasn't civil disobedience. This was attacking. And I think he started up in Galilee. Started gathering people for a rebellion against Rome. And... Uh, Vespasian, the Roman emperor at the time, sent his son Titus, who later became emperor, over to Israel to, to quell this revolt. And so he went up to Galilee chasing this guy. And the guy had gone to different towns in Galilee and recruited people. And he wasn't very nice to the people. In one of those towns, he, he took the men out of the town, coaxed many of them to follow him, and the women and children followed him out of town, telling their husbands, come back home, you know, don't follow this lunatic. But he didn't care. You know, so the women eventually went back. And he, the leader and the guys he recruited, went down to Jerusalem. Well, Titus shows up in Galilee to put an end, and he finds out this guy's already gone. So he goes into town, and the people are all happy to see him, like, fine, you're going to help us out, <laughs> you know, you're going to deliver us from this lunatic. But that wasn't why he was there. He basically took over. He put up a couple fortresses and soldiers to keep the place uh, under control. And, but it, he did a good thing. He was kind of balanced. He didn't punish anybody, even though many of the people joined uh, this rebel from that town. He didn't punish anyone in the town because he thought, you know, there are probably more people here who didn't follow than who wanted to follow. So it's better to let a few guilty people go free than to punish a bunch of innocent people. So he just gave him a warning. Say, don't do this again. And you know, Rome could uh, back up their <laughs> warnings. So the people probably got the point. Anyway, he starts heading back to Jerusalem or down to Jerusalem to confront this guy. And this guy sets up camp in the temple. Now, he was not a priest. He shouldn't have gone in the temple. That's only for priests. The, the descendants of Aaron were the priests. The descendants of Levi were the temple workers. They're the only ones who could go in there. But this rebel and his followers basically kicked the priests out and said, we're going to have choose priests based on votes. We're going to toss the dice to see who's going to be a priest. We're not going to follow family line anymore. Well, they didn't have the authority to do that. They just ran in, took over. They also kidnapped a bunch of people, leading citizens, to kind of keep the population quiet because, you know, we have your people. <laughs> if you don't go along with us, they're going to be in trouble. But then they thought, well... <clears throat> If we keep these people uh, prisoner, then the population might rebel and they might charge. You know, we better not do that. So they killed them all. <laughs> so now the people had no reason to attack. So they messed things up royally. And um, 
Titus gets down there and finds out that this guy is in the temple. And so what does he do? He destroys the temple, 70 A.D. So this rebellion's been going on for a couple of years. Travel was slow back then. So in 70 A.D., he burns Jerusalem, the whole city, and tears down the temple and burns it just to quell this rebellion. And it did the job. There weren't any rebellions after that. A couple more things. Back to verse 12 here where it says the family members are going to turn each other in. Well, that happened in this rebellion in 68 to 70. The, uh, this renegade, this zealot and his, his uh, army were actually stealing from the Jews, the Jewish population. And Josephus, in his uh, account of all of this, and the wars of the Jews... Um, he said that the Jewish people considered it less of a loss to be robbed by the Romans than to be robbed by their own people, by this renegade, because he took more than the Romans did. And the people, families were divided. It's like the Civil War in America. Families were divided. Some people sided with the zealots. Some people sided with the, the rest of the population. And so you had what's in verse 12 here going on. In 70 A.D. So that was the second abomination of desolation. When those zealots went into the temple and desecrated it, basically. They were Jews, but they shouldn't have been there. They were out of place to be there, and so they messed things up. And the third abomination of desolation will happen in the tribulation, when the Antichrist breaks his agreement with Israel and... uh, walks into the temple and messes things up. But we're out of time. So we'll have to continue with that next time. Any observations, comments? <clears throat> the rebellion by the zealots started in 68. And it went on for two years, three years, <laughs> and then the Romans put an end to it in 70. Daniel just said the abomination of desolation. I think probably the one in the tribulation. Yeah. Based on the language he uses and stuff, it would fit that one better. There is, a, there is considerable debate over <coughs> the abomination of desolation, um, whether it already happened or whether it's describing something in the future. Yeah. Whenever you get theologians together, <laughs> nothing's going to be settled. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer. Again, Father, we thank you for the fact that you are still in control, will always be. We thank you that even though things are going to get bad, we have a resource. We thank you for giving us the warning signs so that we can be prepared and be alert uh, and spread the news before it's too late. In Jesus' name, amen.